Hi, this is Jason Nickleby, coordinator of officials with the Minnesota State High School League, and this is basketball training tape number three. Um, hopefully these tapes and plays are helpful for you as you have pre-games and have discussions with your crew about mechanics and philosophy and how we handle plays and how we handle people. And uh, I think we're doing a great job, so hopefully these are helping in that regard. Again, these plays are meant to pick on any one official or team. Um, they're meant for learning opportunities, and hopefully that's working uh, for you and your crews as we progress with the season. With that, let's get to the plays. On this first clip, we have a backcourt throw-in with pressure, and mechanically, it's very well done. We have the C staying back to help, um, which is great because the new trail has a backcourt count. He has foul, no foul, and then a potential violation at the end. So a lot of things to consider. So very nice job by the C staying back and helping in this. Um, I'm totally fine without a violation for 10 seconds in this case. It's really tight. When she gets control of the ball, it's around 1041 or so. And then it's real close, 1031, 1030, somewhere in that neighborhood when she crosses the midcourt line. So totally fine not having one. It's real tight. We don't want to nitpick these. If it's an obvious violation, then, then let's get it. And we have another example of that later in this tape. But um, this one's real tight, so totally fine not, not having it. But I wanted to point out... Um, the rule set that we need to be aware of for this type of play, and mainly the fact that when the ball is in the air in the pass, it's still in the backcourt. And that's just something we need to consider when we're ruling on this type of play. Um, the rules we need to know for this particular um, play is 9-8, 4-12-2-B, and 4 4 3 um, And those rules just basically tell us that in order to have a backcourt, 10-second uh, violation. Um, the ball needs to be in continuous control of the offensive team for more than 10 seconds in the backcourt. So what you need to know is team control and status of the ball as well. So that applies to how long the ball is in uh, consecutive con control, continuous control in the backcourt. So um, it just points out that when the ball is in the air on a pass, it's still in the backcourt in this case. Um, it maintains the status of where it last touched the ground or touched the player. So just we, we need to be aware of those particular rule sets. Um, not a huge deal in this particular play. Totally fine not having a violation, but I just wanted us to be aware of those three particular rule uh, references because those are the ones we need to know to rule on this play because potentially we could have a really long pass that is over the front court and still result in a 10 second violation. But overall, mechanically well done, uh, good coverage by the crew. On this play, we'll have a throw in on the near side and they'll enter the ball into the paint and the offensive player will dribble drive down the lane line nearest the bench. And then it will subsequently go out of bounds and the lead doesn't have a real good look at it because it's opposite him. It opens up to the C, she has a real good look at it, and then she is able to provide help to the lead who doesn't see um, any of the action involving the basketball. So this is very well done. The lead signals that the clock should stop, then he looks to the center for help, she immediately gives him feedback, and then he signals that it's going to be going the other direction. So you can't really tell who it goes off of, but very decisive, um, very good help. Um, this is exactly how we should provide help when it is asked for. If you're the lead or any other official and you have an out-of-bounds play and you're not sure, just blow your whistle, make the dead ball signal by raising your hand in the air, and then look directly at your partner or partners and ask for help. Um, you can ask verbally or um, just give them the look, so to speak. Um, but either way, this is really well done. Lead, uh, very patient. Ask for help, doesn't guess, good decisive uh, help by the C, well done. I wanted to show this play because it's a really good example of being ready to officiate, not coasting into a game. Um, we have the opening tap of the game and it's immediately shot over by the bench and we have a scramble for the ball and then an out of bounds play 
and the U1 is ready to officiate and makes a decisive call. So um, it's just a good example of officials being ready, being focused. I know it's a championship game, so it's a, maybe a little bit easier to get ready and focused, but we tend to um, think we can maybe coast into a game or maybe the jump ball isn't that big of a deal. We'll just throw it up and we'll start playing. Um, but this is an example of being ready to officiate and uh, being very decisive because if we screw this play up mechanically, um, you know, the coaches are not as supportive of our program as maybe they should be because we started off the game on a poor note. But in this case, we do a great job of being ready to officiate and uh, we use good mechanics. Uh, the U1 has his hand ready chops on the start of the clock and then is ready to officiate on the out of bounds play. So well done by the crew. Um, good focus and good job of being ready. This play had a lot of elements to it, and it was really well handled by the officials. Um, I'm really proud of them and how they handled themselves in this particular play and the whole game long as well. Um, we have a tight scramble for the ball. We have a held ball. Good job of coming in, having a presence so that nothing further happens after the held ball on the floor. Well done. Get the players cleared, and then we have the subsequent throw-in. So we'll have a throw-in on the baseline, and it's coming off of a held ball, and we'll have a foul at the top of the key. Um, very decisive ruling by the C in this case. She has an intentional foul. I think that's totally fine. We can nitpick all we want, whether it's flagrant, um, whether it's intentional, whether it's just a regular foul. You know, it's real easy for officials to officiate this play by looking at replay a bunch of times and looking at it slow motion. I thought in the heat of battle, in a really tough, tightly contested game, um, I thought this was really well handled by the officials. Um, very decisive, did a nice job with this play, and did a great job with this game in general. Um, but I wanted to point out, not so much the foul, but I wanted to point out that we have a throw in coming off of a held ball, and then we have a foul. Um, prior to the throw-in being completed. So um, what that brings into play is Rule 645, and that states that the opportunity to make an alternating possession throw-in is lost if the throw-in team violates. If either team fouls during an alternating possession throw-in, it does not cause the throw-in team to lose the possession arrow. If the defensive team commits a violation during the throw-in, the possession arrow is not switched. So what we have here is a foul prior to the throw-in being completed, which means we're not going to switch the arrow. Um, it's not very common, doesn't happen a whole ton, but it did happen in this case, and the arrow was properly not switched. And we just need to communicate that with the table if we have that situation in one of our games um, during the regular season. And we should probably bring both coaches together and communicate that with them as well, because it's a pretty unusual situation where we would have a foul prior to the throw in being completed and we wouldn't switch the arrow because when we get to the next held ball is when everyone gets confused and upset because they're like, well, we already had a held ball. Why are we not going the other direction? And this would be the reason why. So um, just keep that rule in mind. Make sure you explain it to both coaches and the table so that everyone's on the same page, just as this crew did here. Um, very well done, well handled, um, just an unusual situation that I wanted to show. I just wanted to use this play just to reinforce what we talked about earlier regarding backcourt counts. Um, the trail starts his count nice and controlled. He's officiating uh, the players while maintaining his, his count. And he takes a look at the clock just to verify that he has a good solid 10 count. And then he signals that we have a 10 second violation. So very well done. It's a solid 10 seconds. Um, I believe that uh, he uses the clock to help him verify that he has a good solid 10, and that's what we can do um, to match up with our count. We still want to have a manual 10 count um, while we're doing this, but it can help us have an accurate 10 second count if we look at the game clock when the ball gets in play, and then we can maintain that count for 10 seconds, and then um, there really is nothing to argue when we can uh, verify that it, 10 seconds have elapsed off the game clock and compare that with the manual count. So well done here by the new trail.
this play is a pretty good example of proper mechanics and then good communication and signals uh, between crewmates. So we have a missed free throw. The C does a nice job of taking a step down, closing down, signals that the clock should start on the missed free throw. And then we have a turnover and transition and good coverage by the crew going back. And we have a nice tip signal by the trail indicating that the ball has been tipped by the defense, which means anyone can get it in the backcourt. And uh, then good coverage on the way back. So um, just really well done by the trail here to signal the ball is tipped so that we don't have any inadvertent whistles as far as backcourt uh, violations are concerned. And good job of officiating the players, maintaining your space, uh, good free throw mechanics and good coverage at the end. So overall, well done by the crew. On this play, we'll have a free throw violation by a member of the free throw shooting team and the free throw is properly canceled by the center. He wipes it out signals who the violation is on and then we give the ball to the opposing team so just really well done by the C here he's watching what he's supposed to be watching uses proper mechanics and if you notice the the chart in the officials manual this indicates where the C and the lead should be looking for violations and the trail um, will help with the uh, players outside of the arc as well and the trail should close down to help on rebounding and they can help with violations on these three players at the top if they enter the three-point line prior to the ball hitting the rim, it would be a violation on them. Um, however, in this case, we have a member of the free throw shooting team on that uh, lane line closest to the bench who violates. So well done by the C here. He's watching what he's supposed to be watching. Um, just make sure as a crew, we discuss these types of plays and who's going to take what. Um, the official's manual tells you to take the spaces indicated. Um, maybe as a crew you decide you're going to take the near lane line and the lead will take his near lane line. Um, that's fine too, but just make sure that we don't miss plays like this. It's obvious that this crew knew who was looking at what and they followed the, the official's manual, which is great, and we get this. So well done mechanically. That's the end of this tape. Hopefully these plays have been helpful for you as we've gone along with the season. Um, hopefully it's providing some plays you can discuss with your crew and how you're going to handle plays mechanically. Um, we're off to a great start with the season. Let's keep it up. We'll have a couple more tapes as we go, and uh, good luck this weekend and in the coming weeks.